Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started uh, with some of the be beginning introductions here. Um, this is our April AI4C, Artificial Intelligence for uh, Clinicians. Uh, it's the, our lecture series that's presented by the Data Science Office um, of Mass General Brigham. I'm Kathy Andriel, and today we have a, a wonderful speaker. We're lucky to have Dr. Paul Yi. Um, but uh, let me first go through some of the uh, logistics here. As you know, this is monthly, uh, virtually, uh, every second Thursday of the month, September through May. So we just have one more after this month before we take a little bit of a break in the summer. Um, you can see our previous uh, speakers from the winter term. We also have from this fall term who have spoken. And as you know, you can view past recordings from our, our Data Science Mass General Brigham website. If you're internal, some of these are held only internally, and there's the website for that. Uh, we do ask you to please fill out the survey uh, link that we'll, Carrie Ann's going to put in the chat for us. Um, that way we can make changes or uh, improvements to the series um, and make sure that we're providing what you would like out of the series. As always, you can uh, watch these anytime. You can follow us on LinkedIn and, and Twitter uh, and, and our website and so on. So um, I am thrilled to invite uh, Dr. Paul Yi today um, for our April speaker. Paul, or Dr. Yi, received his bachelor's in medical sciences and MD degrees, both from uh, Boston University, as part of the BU Liberal Arts and Medical Education Program. So welcome back to Boston, Paul, virtually, though. Um, after completing two years of orthopedic surgery uh, out west uh, at UC uh, San Francisco, he did a radiology residency and subsequently a fellowship in musculoskeletal imaging, both at Johns Hopkins University. He's also done a fellowship in imaging informatics um, at the University of Maryland. And he subsequently joined University of Maryland faculty there to build and direct the University of Maryland Medical Intelligent Imaging or the UM2II Center, where he leads an interdisciplinary lab of physicians and engineers to build AI and medical imaging, really from bench to bedside. He's currently an assistant professor there uh, in diagnostic radiology and nuke medicine, nuclear medicine at the University of Maryland. And he's got an adjunct research scientist appointment at Hopkins Malone Center for Engineering in Healthcare. Dr. Yi's has been the recipient of, of multiple uh, awards, uh, even very early in his career. He re received, in fact, uh, the Early Career Achievement Award from the Society for Imaging Informatics, among others. And he's published, get this, over 130 uh, peer-reviewed uh, manuscripts. His work has been profiled in a number of outlets, including US News and World Report, Scientific American, and the Los Angeles Times. As a practicing physician scientist, Dr. Yi's research really focuses on the development of AI tools for medical imaging applications with a special emphasis on looking at the trustworthiness and the fairness of deep learning models. And that's what we're gonna hear a bit about today um, in his talk titled, Practical Considerations for Addressing Fairness and Bias Issues in AI for Radiology. So Dr. Yi, I'm gonna stop share and you uh, can go ahead and share and we'll get started. Sure. Well, thank you so much, um, Kathy and the MGH uh, Brigham DSO for the wonderful uh, invitation and that very kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and hopefully my screen should be sharing. I think it is. <laughs> it is. All right. So, all right. So um, the title of my talk today is Practical Considerations for Addressing Fairness and Bias Issues in AI for Radiology. This is a topic that's really um, near to my heart, both as a physician as well as an AI researcher. And I hope that it'll uh, be the start of some really good conversations, um, both internally here at MGH and Brigham and Women's, and hopefully externally with the broader societies in uh, AI and radiology and medicine. So the following are my financial disclosures. And I uh, want to give a shout out to SIM, uh, where I know Kathy threw, and a lot of the other great initiatives through journals like Radiology AI. All right, so for anyone on this webinar, I'm gonna guess it's no surprise that lots of people are excited about AI. We're seeing this really impact every facet of our lives, whether it's Tesla with self-driving cars or our iPhones with detecting our faces and photos. And this is certainly the case in healthcare where AI is promising to transform everything from paperwork automation to diagnosis of images. And this has certainly been the case in radiology where we've seen a literal exponential growth of AI papers in our literature over the past several years. 
Unfortunately, in healthcare, AI has demonstrated things like racial bias, where these algorithms that have a lot of promise, that have high accuracies, may actually perform worse on certain demographic groups. For example, uh, Black people in this uh, example were discriminated against by a real world algorithm used by insurance companies to allocate healthcare resources. And AI models in radiology have been no exception with state of the art chest x ray deep learning classification models demonstrating under diagnosis bias um, in underserved patient populations across sex, age, and. So, based on these examples of bias in radiology AI and the potential to perpetuate health disparities, today we'll focus on three practical aspects of the life cycle of AI and radiology. The first is data sets. The second is definitions of bias as well as demographics. And the final is considerations for clinical deployment and monitoring. I want to emphasize that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Fairness, bias, and ethics at large is a huge topic. And so I want to focus today on some particularly salient practical considerations and hopefully let this be the start of a conversation that will be ongoing. So let's talk about data. So in AI, a common truism is data is the new oil or the gold mine, sometimes people say. And so it goes, if you have really great data, you're more likely to get a really good model out. So maybe diamond quality. On that same token, though, if you have not so great data, as the adage goes, garbage in, garbage out. And one common example of this kind of quality of data is ground truth labels. Uh, this is a previous study where we showed that for chest x-ray tuberculosis classification, uh, deep learning models trained with labels of tuberculosis curated by radiologists consistently beat those derived from natural language processing, regardless of data set size. But another form of data quality that I want to submit to you is diversity. Diversity, not just in disease presentations, but also demographics. Unfortunately, when it comes to diversity of data in medicine, you know, our literature hasn't been so great. This is a review of 74 deep learning studies performed by Dr. Kurt Langloth out at Stanford and his colleagues, where they looked at studies across multiple specialties, radiology, ophthalmology, dermatology, and pathology. And what they found was pretty striking. Of these really exciting studies, the vast majority of data sets came from only four states, California, Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania. So really bi-coastal, but ignoring large swaths of the population. The implication here is that if you train a model on images, let's say from one or just a few states, this might not generalize or apply the same way to other populations. And in our field, there's been a number of chest x-ray data sets released, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, starting with the NIH chest x-ray 14 data set back in 2017, and followed closely by Chexpert from Stanford. But one of the questions is, you know, despite these large data sets spanning over 100,000 images each, how diverse are they? And so we performed a systematic review of publicly available chest x-ray data sets to evaluate for one, how often were demographics reported and two, what demographics were reported. There's some good news. Uh, the majority of these data sets did report demographics in some form, about 80%. But when we look at the diversity of it, perhaps not surprising, but still concerning, the majority of images came from the US with the rest coming from mainly Europe and Asia. Um, most data sets did report demographics, and most of them did report age and sex. However, very few reported race or ethnicity or insurance status, which in the U.S. at least is a common co uh, correlate with these demographic variables. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, data science competitions like Kaggle are another popular source for data used to develop AI models in radiology. And these offer the incentives of huge cash prizes, tens of thousands of dollars, for people bringing their best models to the, uh, to the competition. But when we look at these data sets on Kaggle for these competitions, again, we find that the majority do not report demographics at all. And when they do report demographics, they're usually age or sex and seldom variables like race. And so the implication here is that even if we have these tremendous world-class models being developed, if we're not reporting these demographics in the first place, we won't even be able to identify whether or not an algorithm is biased or fair. And so why is this important? Well, biased data can lead to biased AI models. This was landmark work published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that showed that as you have increasing imbalances in male or female representation and training data, you'll actually have different performances. Namely, if you have 100% females in a training data set, 
you're going to have worse performance on males compared to a model trained with mostly males. Now, this might seem obvious because in chest X-rays, we do see anatomical differences such as breast tissue. And so some people, like Dr. Hugh Harvey, have wondered, well, what about places where anatomical differences aren't as obvious? What about head CTs? What about ankle fractures? Or maybe knee X-rays? So just take a moment. I want you to guess uh, which of these images is a male and which is a female. So what I'll tell you is I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist. I have prior training in orthopedic surgery. I would not be able to tell you this. But in fact, the one on the right is a male and the one on the left is a female. And so we actually evaluated whether or not deep learning models can identify these differences potentially and have biased um, deep learning models. And what we found was very similar results. When you train an algorithm on only male or only female images, you have significantly worse performance on the underrepresented or unrepresented um, sex group. And what's important, interesting is when we look at these heat maps, which do have some limitations in explainability, the heat maps are pretty reassuring for the models um, trained on males when tested on males and females tested on females. But when they're tested on the opposite sex, we get some strange activations, so things away from the knee joint, which is really the area of interest. So what this might imply is that these models are learning features, um, or not learning features, rather, that they're encountering when they see images from a sex that they never saw in training. So why is this important? Because of something called shortcut learning. And so usually the way we hope uh, for a deep learning model or any AI algorithm for that matter is that we get an input image and then we can predict abnormal or... But with shortcut learning, there's usually some confounding feature that allows the algorithm to make the correct diagnosis, but for the wrong reason. And one common example of this is for pneumothorax. So this has been shown by our group and others that AI algorithms that can detect pneumothorax can do so with high accuracies, but often use something called a chest tube as a proxy for it. Um, chest tubes are treatments for pneumothorax. So if you see a chest tube, there's a pretty good chance you have one, but it's not quite the same as identifying the actual disease or injury of interest. And uncannily, uh, these algorithms can also exploit things like laterality markers. Uh, this is an algorithm we trained to look for abnormalities on extremity x-rays. And there's some signal apparently in the R's and the L's and perhaps the fonts of these seemingly innocuous features that allow the algorithm to make the correct diagnosis. And the implication here for fairness and bias is that these algorithms can also detect patient reported race, biological sex, age, and even insurance status. And so, what can happen is if these algorithms can identify these things, it could be a shortcut to make the right diagnosis, but for the wrong reasons. And so this has been shown throughout the literature um, for everything from age, sex, insurance status, the race, um, and again, age and sex. So again, the idea of shortcut learning is that if the algorithms can identify age, sex, or race, these can be used as a way to calibrate findings or rather um, diagnoses in a way that we're not intending. So a lot of times we worry about this uh, detection of race, detection of sex. But I want to submit to you and ask you, is there a silver lining with this? And I think that we can use these features that are unintended of algorithms, perhaps for our benefit. And one of these might be filling in the gaps. So as we talked about, oftentimes the data sets that we use um, in the literature are missing demographics. Either it's incomplete or they don't report them at all. So one opportunity is we can take these algorithms that have been trained to identify sex, age, and race, and recover them to create a more complete data set so that the metadata is more complete. We can perhaps improve our data set curation and actually use these algorithms uh, for good. And so one of the exciting things we're doing um, with collaboration with one of my colleagues, Jeremiah Sula at Hopkins BME, in collaboration with the American College of Radiology, is establishing standards for these reporting. The reality is that this is such a new field. We're learning as we go. And so um, one of the things that needs to happen is benchmarks and standards need to be established for how do we report these, which ones should be reported, and how should they be disseminated. And so be on the lookout for uh, this work coming out of Pipeline. And so I want to end th this section with some open questions to just spark some thinking. First is, how should we best report demographics? The second is how can we address data set imbalances, whether using algorithms previously trained or maybe curating data in a prospective fashion. And the final is how do we address labeled noise? Um, work that I didn't present, 
um, that we've shown is that natural language processing tools actually have bias themselves, which means that certain demographic groups will have higher rates of inaccurate disease labels, which can also be a contributor to bias. So let's shift gears from data sets to definition. So we talk about fairness a lot, and I think that it's a word that is um, can often be emotionally charged. It's obviously very important, but you know I think it really uh, takes us, requires us taking a step back and asking what do we mean by fairness. So the dictionary defines this as the quality or state of being fair, especially fair or impartial treatment. And I submit to you that this is a fairly vague definition, and it doesn't necessarily lend itself well to AI and statistical analyses. In fact, however, there have been specific machine learning glossaries around things like fairness. But even then, these definitions can be confusing. Let's go back to this work that was published in the PNAS, where they showed that, hey, if you train an algorithm on 100% females, you're going to perform better on female patients than an algorithm trained with 0% females. And the idea here is that these comparisons are really taking two models, one trained on 0% females, one trained on 100% females, on one test set. And if, but if we kind of take an analogy of how do we evaluate is Professor A or Professor B biased, we would basically be asking, hey, does Professor A or B create male students harder or less hard than uh, the other? And I ask, is this the correct notion of bias? You know, I would posit that the actual way or the more proper way, at least from a clinical standpoint, is saying not two models, one test set, but one model and two test sets. So. Professor A, do you grade males systematically higher or worse than females? Um, and the implication here is that in the previous paradigm, it could just be if Professor A grades males higher than Professor B, we're not accounting for whether or not Professor A just tends to grade all patients or all students higher. And so if we take this reframing of this problem and we actually reproduce the results and reanalyze, what we find is Kind of a reversal of findings. One, a lot of the biases that were previously concluded don't actually show up. But number two, what's interesting is that when we train models on only on 100% females, we actually have systematic bias still favoring males, which implies that there is bias, but it's not exactly um, super intuitive or straightforward. And so this is just to say that we have to really think about how do we frame these statistical kind of frameworks and translate them in the ways that it make clinical sense. And beyond these standard notions of bias is the idea of statistical definitions. Uh, we often think about things in medicine and radiology, uh, especially in diagnostics, about sensitivity, specificity, how there's a trade-off often between the two. And that confusion to this, there's a notion of the incompatibility of fairness metrics. And it's this idea that there's no single universal metric for quantifying fairness, because again, Usually, if we have higher sensitivity, we're going to have lower specificity. Um, just to drive home the point, we often think about AURLC curves. This is a nice kind of broad strokes way of evaluating a model's performance. But again, we have to choose a threshold and operating point in practice, which will necessitate some trade-offs between sensitivity, specificity, PPV, and PV, et cetera. And um, yeah, and it's not just AURLC. And so this is a study that we did um, where we trained AI models using only male, only female, and balanced 50-50 uh, chest x-rays to identify pulmonary edema. And we looked at AURLC, we find that these are very similar. They're statistically not different in about 0.8. But when we apply two common definitions of bias, equality of opportunity, which is having equal true positive rates within a certain acceptable range of disparity, or equalized odds, which is equal to PR and FPR, what we find is that across varying thresholds, let's say 6%, um, we still have a pretty, uh, a non-trivial percentage of models that are not fair. In fact, the majority are not fair in this scenario. And if we really make that very liberal 24%, which I would submit to you is unacceptable from a clinical standpoint, we still have nearly half of models according to equalized odds being uh, unfair. And so this is just to say that one, AURLT um, is not the only metric that we should be using for evaluating fairness because we do have to operationalize these things. But number two, fairness can be really hard to achieve um, even when AURLT suggests that the models are fair. And so this is to say that uh, context matters. So some of you might've seen this photo of Prince William making his rounds on Twitter uh, a few years back. 
And, uh, you know, he seems like a nice guy, but here, I don't know, maybe he's having a bad day. But if we look here at the front, he's actually holding up three fingers. And so radiology, we often say one view is no view. We have to take every piece of data or every um, observation within the context. And so I think fairness similarly must be defined contextually. Just because a model is fair or unfair under a certain operating threshold, let's say to maximize sensitivity for a screening exam, it might actually be fair if we kind of use it in a diagnostic or confirmatory um, setting where we maximize specificity. All right, so moving beyond statistical definitions, let's talk about demographics. So we live in a world where traditional norms are no longer so. Things like gender, um, which previously might have been binary and taken for granted, are becoming much more nuanced. And I think it's important, um, given the changing landscape, given how important this is in our society, just for human identity, we have to really be precise in demographic definitions. So gender and biological sex, um, these are often conflated in data sets, even uh, really prominent ones like MIMIC, where the literal data definition in the dictionary says that gender is the genotypical sex. Now, this is literally not correct. But again, I think it's just reflective of the fact that society changes our research is changing, and so I think it's an iterative process. Uh, in a similar vein, traditional norms regarding race are no longer so. You know, it's, I think it's pretty well accepted now that race is a social construct. There may be some correlates or well-intentioned or actually maybe not well-intentioned kind of um, correlates with uh, genetic ancestry or place of ancestry, but it in and of itself is so a social construct. And to drive on the point, even the terms like Asian American, which describe a particular continent to geographic place, it's a pretty coarse um, label that describes a whole range of different people um, who have very different kind of appearances phenotypically, have very different um, uh, propensities for different diseases and healthcare implications. And so why does this matter? You know, right now, if you look at the US census, we do report race, we do report ethnicity. And these are used to measure things by the government for things like health disparities, which have implications for policy. But again, these are very coarse labels. So what happens if we use these coarse labels and ignore maybe these more granular types of identities? So we evaluated this in a study where we replicated or reproduced rather state-of-the-art um, deep learning model for chest x-ray diagnosis. And we evaluated for underdiagnosis by it, which means are, is the model more likely to incorrectly predict no disease when there is a disease, with the implication being that having higher rates of underdiagnosis can potentially limit access to health care, the treatments. And we looked at the bias based on course labels, so Asian, Black, White, Hispanic, Latino, compared to when we measure bias using more granular labels. So let's say for Asian, we have the Korean, Chinese, Indian. And what we found was pretty striking. One, there is a uh, bias where white patients have lower underdiagnosis rates, so they have better performance compared to Asian, Black, and Hispanic, Latino. But perhaps more strikingly, within each course racial group, we have a wide spread of underdiagnosis rates. You know, with Asian, you've got a spread ranging from less than 20% to over 40%. Within Hispanic, Latino, nearly 100% to almost zero. And the implication here is that this variation within a course group often exceeded that between the um, course groups. And so this really echoes this idea that, hey, race is a social construct. There's actually greater diversity within a specific racial group than between them. And so this is important, again, because if we're not measuring these disparities precisely, we may be, one, not aware of these disparities that do exist, and two, the healthcare policies and healthcare resource allocation that might happen as a result might actually disadvantage groups of people who are going unseen. And just to drive home this point of race being a social construct, uh, this was a study where we basically trained these algorithms to identify a patient reported race. Overall, there's very high performance. But what we find is that in the testing sets, there's confounding based on age, where if you have a higher proportion of younger patients or a higher proportion of older patients, you're going to have quite a difference in the performance. And so there does appear to be um, often these correlations and maybe shortcut learning. So again, the idea is that, hey, Maybe we can predict race, but we're using age as a proxy. And so I want to end this section with some open questions.
The first is how do we achieve precision and consensus in notions of bias, as well as statistical definitions? Similarly, how can we be more precise about demographics that really reflects our changing societies, but also differences in societies between different countries? You know, even this talk of race in the United States, it's a very American centric kind of view of things that might not necessarily translate to other countries, um, other parts of the world. And number three, uh, how do we operationalize these standards? You know, once we figure them out, how can we get it out so that it is being used um, in a standardized and uh, consistent way in our literature? So uh, the final part of this talk is clinical deployment and monitoring. Since we've talked about data sets used to train AI models, we talked about definitions of fairness and how to assess them. Well, what do we do when we uh, when the rubber meets the road and these algorithms are actually in clinical use? So there's been a lot of excitement over companies like Google releasing apps to use AI to diagnose diseases like skin cancer, even from your smartphone. Now note that this is available in Europe. I don't know, I don't believe it's available in the US yet, but nonetheless, it's pretty cool, right? But people have pointed out that these apps, after they've been deployed, they're prone to being developed on data that's biased against underrepresented groups. For example, in this case, less than 4% dark skin types. Any implications are, well, if you have darker skin, this algorithm might not perform as expected. In radiology, we've had similar kinds of apps released. Uh, this is a Bone Age app by a company called 16-Bit. Really amazing technology. It was the winner of the 2017 RSNA Machine Learning Challenge had radiologist level performance for bone age and a really cool app to boot. You can put it up on your phone, take a photo of an x-ray, upload an image, and it gives you a bone age really quickly and really accurately. But one question we had was, is this biased? And so we asked the question, are, is there gonna be bias based on sex, based on age? And one of the reasons that we decided to evaluate this is that geography matters. As we talked about, a lot of times these data sets are from one, maybe two states. And this was actually the case for the RSNA uh, Bone Age Challenge data set. They were from Stanford and Children's Hospital, Colorado, predominantly white and higher socioeconomic areas. So we test this on a set of data sets of racially diverse children from Los Angeles. Um, again, West Coast, but slightly different locale than let's say Palo Alto or in Aurora, Colorado. And the short story uh, or long story short is that yes, there were clinically significant biases, meaning errors in bone age that would result in a different diagnosis of advanced or normal or delayed bone age. And these, unfortunately, um, disadvantage females, children who are older or younger, and non-white children. And one of the more concerning pieces is when we interrogated the model to see how often were the errors over-predicting or under-predicting bone age. When we look at the racial bias, for instance, there really is no discernible pattern, which means that these deep learning models, we can't just, uh, it's hard to pinpoint, is it overcalling, undercalling, and it seems a little bit unpredictable. Um, so most recently, a lot of us are probably using ChatGPT and large language models, and this has been something that uh, certainly caught me by surprise. But, and here in radiology, uh, we published one of the first evaluations of ChatGPT for giving patient um, educational responses to common questions about breast cancer screening. And astoundingly, nearly 90% of questions were answered appropriately. But even here with GPT, um, with large language models, we're finding that there's bias. So this is a paper that was recently published by uh, a good friend of mine and Kathy, Judy Gachoya and colleagues, where they asked questions about clinical vignettes. Basically, hey, here's a patient history, here's your symptoms, give me a differential diagnosis. And what they found is just by changing the patient's race, you're gonna get a differential diagnosis that's different um, a lot of the time. And the implication here again is that, you know, you ask a doctor, you know, is there a difference in the differential diagnosis based on Asian or white or black versus Hispanic? Most of the time they're gonna say, no, this shouldn't affect it. But there is bias evidently in these large language models. And kind of in a different lane from the clinical side, um, we've evaluated Dolly and asked, hey, what do you think a radiologist looks like? And what we can see here is differences in attire between females and people of color compared to white folks and males. Now, the implications here are unclear. You know, are scrubs more or less professional than shirt and tie and white coat? I'm not sure, but uh, there are some differences that we identified. And so some open questions for clinical deployment is first, how do we measure bias in real time? I think this is one of those um, perpetual questions that anyone who's in charge of quality or informatics is asking 
we've got these algorithms. They're really cool. Um, they seem to work really well in retrospect, but how can we monitor them when we don't have ground truth, when we're actually looking at it prospectively? The second is how do we regulate biased evaluations of clinically deployed models? Um, a lot of times, and there's a lot of research that happens with FDA clearance, with trying to convince someone to buy it. But when a model is purchased and deployed, there's often less incentive to do this. And so um, this is something where I think, uh, well, I'll say I think the ACR, FDA are working together along with other groups. There's a lot of exciting work coming down the pipeline. And finally, uh, how do we prevent biases from being propagated during model fine tuning? This is something that I'm sure that you all have heard a lot on the um, AI for C uh, lecture series. And so this is something that, um, especially with the idea of foundation models being developed by uh, groups like Google and researchers um, independently, this is a big concern. And so uh, some practical takeaways from this talk. The first is uh, fairness and bias in AI for radiology can be addressed at multiple levels. The first being data. And I would recommend um, in broad strokes, demographic reporting is the first step. We have to know what we're dealing with. Do we have imbalances? That allows us to measure biases. And then to the extent possible, intentionally curating data to balance these demographics. The second is definitions. So what I would recommend is that we define the concept of fairness as well as demographic conventions contextually. So this depends on things like the clinical scenario, what types of um, performance metrics are we trying to optimize for a given algorithm? And what is the context of the uh, place that the algorithm is being deployed? Again, being a male or female may mean different things from a health system's um, perspective, depending on where you are in the country, depending on where you are in the world, similar with race and ethnicity. And then with clinical deployment, I think that retrospective evaluation is uh, the lowest hanging fruit. It's absolutely important but we need to move towards something more prospective and real-time surveillance, which I think is gonna require a collaboration between folks on the statistics side, machine learning, and on the clinical sides. And that's just to drive home this point, um, this cartoon from a friend of ours, Rain Geis. We're basically saying, there's a lot of people who can train neural networks. You can go to Coursera, you can go to, you know, learn how to do these things in about a week. But you need people who also understand machine learning as engineering. How do we operationalize these things in imaging informatics workflows? And then people who put patients first, how do we make sure that these are being used in clinically relevant and clinically safe ways? And ultimately, I don't think it's one person. I think it's all of us coming together, whether you're a PhD, an MD, someone who works in health IT. And so I just want to drive on the point that I think collaboration is really key to making these things, one, a reality, and two, helping AI reach its potential without causing harm. So with that, I just want to give a shout out to the Radiology AI podcast that I co-host with Ali Tajani. Please check it out if you'd like to learn more about these and other topics. And again, uh, thank you for your time. I uh, invite you to stay in touch and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, Paul, that was fantastic. Boy, there's a lot to unpack there. Thank you so much. And if people uh, in the audience have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll address them with Paul. But oh my gosh, so many things. First, start with a little anecdote, and that is about the bubble. For those who aren't clinical people, may not know what that is. So people will take an x-ray, typically of the left hand in the anatomical position, and it's usually done on patients who are either growing too slowly or too quickly um, for their chronologic age. And um, back in the 90s, we were looking at this, and those of you who may not know uh, are younger, the way this used to be done was there was an atlas called the Grulican Pile Atlas, and you may still see it in some reading rooms, but it was this book of photographs at patients of different ages. And how was that book created? It was created on um, all white males <laughs> from the Midwest. And so, who you know, uh, we've, we've got an issue there. We know uh, males and females, girls and boys grow at different rates. We know different races grow at different rates and so on. So, you know, we had that issue there. Um, so that's, that's an interesting uh, that you did that study. First comment, fantastic effort with the ACR to go forward and create a standard, a, a established standards for demographic reporting. So uh, folks in radiology may be saying, gosh, we don't get race. <laughs> we don't get uh, self-defined race or self-defined sex, for example, in the reports that we receive. We get an image, we get a patient age, <laughs> uh, maybe, and then and that's what we get. Um, so I think that's a fantastic effort and that's a first step so that we get demographic reporting 
And unfortunately, um, as we are doing many of these machine learning models, um, you mentioned what the challenges that first one that was done in Bone Age. Um, unfortunately, we had to to work with the data that we had, and 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 we we have to recognize that. And I think in that regard, the first thing that we have to say is we recognize this is a biased data set. Um, so, uh, gosh, you did so much work there. Um, I am curious about your thoughts around foundation models. So built on perhaps the internet, we know there <laughs> is some good data and maybe some biased data and maybe some bad data there. Um, we have little control over that, but we, we know that there is some bias in there. And then you have to fine tune after the fact, a little more control there. What are some of the techniques that we can use to understand our data set better and at least be able to recognize that, you know, okay, this is the data set we're operating with, and we know it's not, I, I think we need to know where it's not going to work well. So how do we how do we approach something like that when we look at whether it's a tool that a company comes to us or it's a colleague, a researcher, how do, how do we how do we test that? Yeah, um, no, I think those are all really interesting um, thoughts and questions. I, I think the first thing I heard was the idea of foundation models. The second was data sets. And third, how do we evaluate maybe these tools that are going to come to us from vendors or larger companies, be them foundation models or uh, clinical, um, let's say commercial tools. You know, I think uh, each of those is just so important, right? The thing I want to drive home is that fairness and bias, and just like anything that we're trying to improve with these AI models, there's a whole uh, pipeline of things that we need to consider. It's the data, it's the models themselves, it's what do we do with the models after. So I think starting with the data sets, you know, I think it's um, a really interesting thing. I think a lot of times, um, you know, I can look at a data set and I can, I'm tempted to say, well, of course it's, uh, it's going to be good because it's 50% male, 50% female. It's relatively balanced in terms of age and race or ethnicity. But one of the things I think is um, really impressed on me is just how there's always a trade-off, right? If we try to balance male and female and we try to just get it exactly right, we may end up being imbalanced in other things like disease label distribution. Uh, one of the things that I think is pretty unavoidable is you know, thankfully the majority of images that we obtain in the hospital or a majority of data are going to be disease free. Um, otherwise, literally everyone that walks in the hospital would end up needing surgery or needing some type of medication. What that means is we're already working with relatively small numbers of diseases. And that's no surprise to anyone that works in um, clinical research. But the second piece is that when we try to, let's say, balance male and female, we may introduce other types of biases where, yes, you may have 50% male, 50% female, but maybe within a certain age group, you've got an imbalance in disease labels. And so I think part of this is unavoidable. It just is what it is. Um, but I think, as Kathy said, the first thing is being able to measure these things and evaluate them from a, let's say, metadata kind of um, perspective. But the second thing I was going to say is that, you know, a lot of times, um, I think that these data sets, they may be kind of uh, seen or perceived by these algorithms very different from you and me as humans. Um, you know, one thing that's really interesting is I found is if you train an algorithm on, let's say, a bunch of images from a relatively, um, let's say, ethnically homogenous place, like, uh, um, let's say, chest x-rays from, well, okay, I'm going to, let me take a step back, the implications. I think race is a very kind of thorny subject sometimes. But let's say you take x-rays from, um, let's say, Vietnam. I think Vietnam, if you just look at their um, statistics, most people are ethnically from or racially from Asia. And again, that's a U.S. kind of construct. Uh, if you take an algorithm there and you test them, though, on x-rays from the U.S., you're still probably going to find biases based on race. And so does that mean that, hey, there was an imbalance in race in that Vietnam data set? Um, probably not. Or actually, yes, it's probably mostly Asian. But I think what's inherent there is that these algorithms are finding, in some cases, the actual proxy of interest, the demographic label. But sometimes it's some other factor like the disease distribution or maybe the disease presentation. And so I think that that makes it pretty tricky when we try to, um, you know, let's say, make the perfect data set. So that leads to the second thing, which is how do we evaluate these models, recognizing, hey, the models might not be perfect. So I think what we have to do is 
like any tool, whether it's a medical device, let's say a surgical instrument or an orthopedic implant or a medication, none of those are perfect. And we know that we have things like indications and contraindications, things that we should use them for, like, hey, it should be used in this patient group and these age groups with this disease severity. It should not be used in this type of age group or this particular patient group. I think that AI models are going to be similar. And we, the way we do that is we go back to first principles of clinical research. You know, there's very good um, and established ways that we evaluate these devices. You know, we talk about levels of evidence, level one being a randomized control trial, level two being a prospective non-randomized study, level three being um, like a case uh, control study, level four being a case report. That doesn't necessarily apply one-to-one -one with AI, but I think if we apply similar principles that we can borrow from, let's say, the more clinical kind of traditional kind of research, we're going to be able to still identify these disparities and perhaps create things like a indication, contraindication label. Um, one of the ideas uh, that I have is, you know, maybe one day we'll have an atlas that's kind of like the uh, atlas that medical students use during their time on the wards, where you have all the medications and it tells you, hey, this is the indication, the contraindication, you know, absolute, relative, et cetera. But I think it starts with really taking what we are competent as, as a field, which is a lot of the statistics, a lot of the clinical research kind of evaluations and applying them. Um, and then once we figured out those limitations, um, to your question about, you know, what do we do about foundation models and maybe tweaking some of these tools? I think the jury's out. I think that from a research perspective, um, that's exciting because there's a lot of blue sky to kind of be uh, navigated towards. Um, people have published some papers in our field saying, hey, Foundation models may harbor biases because they encode sex and race and age in their feature or learned features where you can take a model, you can take um, basically all of the learned features and keep the same weights in the model, but just tweak the final um, fully connected layer and basically say, hey, rather than predicting this disease label that you were trained to do, I want you to predict sex or age or race and basically seeing do these learned features, can they be combined in a way to actually predict these things? Now, I think that that's really exciting work. Um, it's been published in the Radiology AI Journal that Kathy, you and I are involved with. Um, but, you know, I think that the field's evolving and even the question of what is a foundation model is being called in the question. In medical imaging, we think, wow, 500,000 images is huge. Like that's a model trained on that as foundation. But if we look at things like ChatGPT or foundation models from Google, these are going to be millions, if not billions of data points. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think that, you know, as these terms become more um, standardized and consistent, even our need to assess these models are going to change and we're going to have to keep doing it. But the second piece that I think is really interesting is how do we address it? There's a paper I actually published yesterday. I learned about, I think I read it this morning in Nature Medicine. It's a paper from Google Health. And they basically show that they can use generative AI to create synthetic images to basically draw and more balance the distribution of underrepresented, let's say, images. And this might not necessarily explicitly be race or age, but saying like, hey, in this feature space, in these data sets, we're having a, a relatively fewer of this particular cluster. Let's create more similar ones. And this is where the idea of the fusion models and all this stuff is really exciting that you can generate these things um, de novo. And what they found is that not only does it improve performance of the model um, overall, it improves generalization to different data sets, and within the data set reduces the biases or disparities based on race, based on age and sex. And that to me is super exciting because um, all of these things are so new. You know, with ChatGPT came out in November of 2022. Um, you know, GPT-4 just came out pretty recently, and now generative AI is having this, um, I would say, a renaissance right now. I mean, this is moving so quickly. It took us 2012 until like 2017 to first use deep learning in our field, at least in uh, the mainstream radiology journals. Right now, we're only at 2024. It's less than two years from these large language and generative models coming out. I think the next five years is going to be incredible for, you know, maybe tackling these problems of fairness and bias, enhancing these data sets by creating new types of data, improving ways of maybe even evaluating um, whether or not a model is biased, you know, there's this idea of using counterfactual kind of um, image generation to figure out, you know, is this algorithm finding the right feature of interest? And so I think that um, the jury's out, but I think the research community is well on their way, uh, both in industry and in academia.
for uh, tackling these things. So um, those are just some initial thoughts. I'd love to elaborate or- uh, No, great. Well, else. so a couple thoughts here. One, uh, one, one thing that we've tried on the technical side is weighting the minority class. And by that, I mean, you know, the underrepresented class. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sometimes that helps, which just sort of goes back to my thoughts of, you gotta know what's in your data cohort. If you don't know what's in your data cohort, then you really don't know the answer of the model. Um, and and so understanding that, and at least recognizing that. My, my thought also is maybe we, our approach in the beginning, you know, in the past sort of seven years, the beginning where we tried so hard to get a diverse data set to make the model more generalizable at the end. And I understand that industry, you know, motivations to be able to do that, but maybe that approach was wrong. Maybe we get good enough to start and then what happens at each side is you fine tune to your data set, because obviously mm -hmm. what we want it to do is to work well in your in your local environment. Um, so I don't know, maybe our uh, approach was wrong, but I, I agree. I think um, it remains to be seen cautiously optimistic about the foundation models um, to see um, where where all of this goes. Um, you know, again, as people try to do some of these challenges, it's based on what access to data that you do have. And that and that's unfortunate. And I think a lot of it has been um, also not knowing what that metadata is. And certainly within radiology, it's not something that at least at our institution, we routinely get um, mm -hmm. even um, as to as to, you know, we, we probably just get sex. And, and that in many cases is a binary, a binary notification there. So a very interesting times. Um, I thought it, your, your studies on looking at saliency maps was <laughs> another important point in that oftentimes, and this is one of my worst fears is that, is that people are gonna blindly accept the results of models. And by that, I mean, you know, it was getting the wrong, the right answer, but for the wrong reason. And there's another, paper that I, I, I like to go back to where, um, I, didn't, I can't remember what they were looking for. I think it was pneumonia on chest X-ray. And the model was performing quite well, but it turns out if you looked at the saliency map, it was focusing on the radiology technologist marker. And in fact, one marker had the left upright, okay? So that means it was done anterior to posterior it was a bedside portable oh. <laughs> and likely those patients were sicker than the flipped marker, which was ambulatory or posterior to anterior where the patient could be upright. So do the cl clinical gut check here where, um, yeah, it was getting the right reason or performing well, but for the wrong, for the wrong reason. Um, yeah. Very, very interesting. The, I, I'm just curious whether people have any questions in the audience. Um, Kirianne, I don't know if we're having trouble. Usually we get lots of questions and no one's putting anything in the questions or the chat GPT. I'm wondering if we've had a little issue with Zoom. Maybe if we open up the mic, if people do have questions, um, that would help. But um, going back to some of the other answers in terms of, of um, implementation, are there things that, you know, I know we look for um, drift in the models and we continuously in real time check for that kind of drift. And we see, you know, technical issues. There's technical bias that we have mm -hmm. to worry about as well, right? You know, someone's come in and done something to the scanner and all of a sudden our model has drifted. What can we do to look for um, fairness and bias? Do we think that that can change? Uh, in clinical implementation. Is there something, or do you have thoughts, or is there something that you do at your institution to look at that as models are clinically implemented? Yeah, um, well, first I'll answer that last question you had about, do we do anything at our institution? Um, say tentatively no. Um, I think it's just one of those things, right? I mean, AI is so new. I think the first uh, frontier is just getting these things deployed and we think, does it work pretty well? I think it's just one of those things that, um, Right now, there's no well-accepted way to do this prospectively. So I think the, um, again, first principles, I think we think about quality control. I think it's just doing these periodic audits in retrospect. Um, we have to be able to go back and compare them to, hey, 
did the AI model agree, or rather did the radiologist or end user physician agree with this finding and then do some analyses thereafter? But I think um, going to the first question you asked, though, like, how can we do this? What are ways that we can tackle this? Um, again, I think it goes back to research. There's been some really cool um, the preliminary work that's been done to use statistical models um, to prospectively evaluate for this drift that you're talking about. You know, when is the model starting to have predictions that are deviating from what we'd expect, um, be it distributions of predicted labels? Um, you know, one of the things too that I think is a confounder for a lot of um, evaluations is the prevalence of disease. You know, I think statistically we want to balance our test sets for 50% or you know equal distribution of disease labels, but in the real world, again, thankfully so. Half of us aren't walking around with cancers in our bodies. So, well, you know, at least that we know of. <laughs> um, half kidding. But um, I think that, you know, well, that's where I think the research is really exciting, you know, trying to figure out can we understand these kind of black box models behaviors through maybe traditional statistical ways or um, doing other types of like sanity checks? I think the idea of, um, using, uh, well, I, I think it's tough. I, I think there's a lot of research. I'm not going to speak too much on that just because I think it's so um, preliminary, but I think that it's not well-developed yet. Um, so I think that at best, what we have right now is using standard quality kind of methods. Um, we can kind of take a tip from the, uh, like MR physicists um, page where, you know, they evaluate these, um, scanners or nuclear medicine, um, you know, quality controls. We want to test them on a regular basis. So I think the gap in our field is. Hey, what's a standard like set of like um, like a battery of tools that we can use to evaluate these models? You know, maybe it's a standardized data set. Maybe it's something that you can uh, you know um, just deploy that's uh, standard rather than each institution, whether it's MGB or Brigham Women's or Maryland, figuring it out on their own. Because uh, you know, I think standardization is key. What do we do about label noise? You know, I, I mean, here we are, we have, you know, and speaking in the narrow range of radiologic imaging, if, you know, we may be um, labeling or annotating our data sets based on the report. And, you know, I yeah. can think back to your days when you were a resident, you may sit with one attending who says it's, you know, moderate, and you sit with another expert attending who says it's uh, severe. And um, both of them have their reasons. And now we're trying to train a mathematical model to recognize that particular label in, let's say, you know, the stenosis in the spine or whatever. Um, how how do you how do you deal with that? Again, we have that's that's noise. That's that's the best that we have right now. What what are, are there any approaches that you know of? that can deal with some of that in terms of label noise. I mean, you know, we don't always have path confirmation of something. Totally. <clears throat> totally. I, I think um, it's going to depend on each clinical problem, but take an example that you put, which is severity, right? We talk about mild, moderate, severe, mild to moderate, moderate to severe. These are things that are highly subjective, right? Um, but one of the uh, potential ways of doing this is actually trying to quantify um, the burden of disease, let's say, rather than um, give some, pseudo like quantitative classification. Um, there's a really interesting paper published by uh, David O. Yang's group. He's a cardiologist at Cedar sinai in uh, New England Journal of Medicine AI recently that basically showed, hey, for looking for severity of cardiac disease, um, it's more accurate, higher performing. And I think they did, and I think maybe fairer to use regression models to quantify the actual burden of disease rather than classifying as mild, moderate, severe. And the idea is it makes sense, right? If we think about mild, moderate, severe, let's say we um, did like 33%, 33 to 66, 66 to 100, that's a huge range. So those are very coarse labels. And again, going back to the idea of coarse versus granular labels, I think that um, these are things that we, um, these are conventions that we use clinically often to simplify things, but it may not translate well to these mathematical kind of approaches. I think the idea of quantifying disease burden, whether it's pneumonia, the amount of opacities in an x-ray, or let's say the um, size of uh, the neuroforamina in like a lumbar spine MRI, that's very intriguing to me as a way to reduce that noise because it is something that's verifiable. We can look at that and say, you know, yep, I put a roller on there. That makes sense. As opposed to like, well, the model said it was moderate or radiologist A said it was moderate, but 
I think it might be lots of moderate, or I think it might be mild. Um, I think that's one way where we get to more um, objective kind of measures. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's a really important thing. That's just one example. Um, the other example is with these disease labels. If you look at it, like you're saying, radiologist A and radiologist B may not agree with each other or with radiology C through Z. It's crazy how much inter-rater variability there is. And in our literature, we often say, like, a fellowship-trained radiologist served this ground truth. And it's kind of like, well, it's one person's opinion. And so I think that um, that's where a lot of cognitive, maybe like psychology or like, you know, other kinds of disciplines are going to really need to weigh in with their expertise of how do we, in the absence of absolute objective ground truth, how do we best get, you know, the best statistical measure of that? So that's another can of worms that I don't think we have time for, but just some food for thought. True, but, and just for those who are writing papers, remember, if you can, in, in um, include a study of interreader variability and show whether the model is at least performing uh, at that or better. We have a question, which is an intriguing question here. Do you think increased ease of obtaining a human genome will have an impact on the bias of AI models for the better over time? And what are your concerns? Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think this is fantastic. I, I'm a radiologist, but my dream is um, that we move beyond just images and we combine it with things like genomics, proteomics, um, even demographics and lab values and the sort. Um, I think that, you know, it's an interesting idea. You know, will having a person's genome impact bias, will it have better performance in AI models? I think it's, uh, it could go either way. I think on one hand, genomics is really what I think um, we often try to do with, uh, uh, try to, simplify the things like race or ethnicity. We're trying to say, hey, this person has genetic ancestry from this part of the world, and there's these implications that have evolved over you know, thousands of years. Um, and so that could be a way that we can better evaluate for, um, let's say, disparities that might be more biologically based, rather than saying, hey, Asian versus white versus black patients have these differences. It's like, no, based on this particular you know, genotype, you have this disparity, and you're going to have this relative benefit or disadvantage of an algorithm. But on the other hand, um, you know, these data sets, unfortunately, genomic data like imaging data are also biased. They traditionally have been very Eurocentric, so mainly white European folks um, having more um, representation. And uh, even valiant efforts like the NIH, um, NHGRI All of Us project, which is designed to create a huge genomic database of representative um, populations in the U.S., there's been some criticism lately about, you know, is this truly representative of the diversity of the U.S.? You know, not just in race and ethnicity, but, you know, kind of different parts of the country. Because um, if you imagine, you know, I think that when I think about being Asian, I'm Korean American. That's a very living in the United States than it would be in Korea or let's say in um, the Midwest or the West Coast. Just because culturally there's differences and that affects things like diet exposure to different environmental factors, and that's going to affect our health. So, um, you know, my concerns are that, you know, yes, this can be very helpful, but we still have to, we can't treat genomics like a panacea, because we still have to have those data sets balanced, they have to be diverse and represented. And also genomics models, polygen risk scores, those things also have to be vetted. Um, so, and there's partici um, there participate participation, I'm sorry, of mm -hmm. uh, a, a diverse participation isn't quite there too. I think that's part of the criticism of of that of that data set in a little bit. But I think, you know, and to to be honest, what we've done in radiology, we've done quite a bit right out the gate. But it's been low hanging fruit, and it's been one off models with with imaging. Um, my excitement is by combining other information. Mm -hmm from the electronic medical record, as well as things like genomics, pathology, and other things to do predictive. Right now we're, we're doing sort of a retrospective, but I would love to see this move to predictive. Well, Dr. Yi, this was fabulous uh, lecture and we really appreciate your time and thank you so very much for a wonderful lecture. Uh, thanks. Thank thanks. you for the invitations, it's been fantastic. Thanks, take care.